All right. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, those of you who are already here, those of you who are still joining in, uh, thank you so much for coming to uh, my webinar about um, how to write a business plan, think of a business plan. A brief word about the <clears throat> SBDC. We are the uh, Florida SBDC at FIU. We are the Miami-Dade County and Monroe County chapter, let's say, of the SBDC, which is the uh, main partner of the SBA uh, to provide assistance to small businesses. And uh, this is me. My name is Alina, and uh, my expertise is in business writing. I have lived in Miami for more than 30 years. And uh, I am uh, delighted to share with you what I know and what I have uh, learned about um, <clears throat> writing a business plan. Please allow me to begin by just sharing with you quickly <clears throat> my gospel of the business plan, which is this. There are three business plans that you as business owners will always be working with. There is the business plan that is in your head. That's where it all begins. Uh, that <clears throat> business plan is pretty much unlimited. It, it's, it, you, it is big. You already see yourself franchising. Uh, and that is good. That's the vision, that's the inspiration. There is the business plan that gets written and that's the one that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and that one can be pretty unlimited too. As we say in Spanish, el papel lo aguanta todo. On paper, you can put anything. And then there's the third business plan, which is the one that gets executed. And what I want to say about that is that the closest you can bring these three plans together, your idea, what you write, and what you execute, the more successful you will be. Let's talk about the written business plan. and. When people say you need a business plan, most of the time they do refer to a written business plan, which is this, it's a document. It's a document that you flesh out to communicate. And the key word here is communicate. Uh, direction activities require so that the business will achieve its most important goal, profitability. Communicate is the most important word. A business plan primarily is a communications tool for somebody who doesn't live in your head and doesn't live your business day to day. You write it and then you have a written document that communicates these aspects of your business, vision, strategies, capacity, resources, advantages, foresight. The most important thing in a written business plan is this credibility. Um, uh, the first, I have seen many versions of a business plan. They all may have content along the lines of my product is the best, my company is the best, I have no competitors, we will make a million dollars in the first year. And that is all fine, it can be written, it is just not credible. To make a business plan credible, it has to have specifics, it has to have cohesiveness between the different parts of it, and it has to have internal validity. And this is what you're aiming for when you're writing, particularly if you're writing it for a lender. So your parts have to drive with each other. In the process of writing it, you step back and you focus and you look at different ways that the, this industry works, this, your products and services are delivered. You make some decisions, you cover some blind spots. That's the value of the exercise of writing a business plan. And this is why you can also write it for yourself, even if no one is asking for it. I see some questions in the q and I understand we're gonna have a time at the end of the session to address the questions. Um, there's many kinds of businesses. Therefore, every business plan is different, but 
there's a standard content that is expected in a business plan, regardless of what type of business it is. And these are standard sections that a reader would expect to see in a business plan document. Um, different outlines organize these sections in different ways. I kind of go along this. I have a, an out, I use an outline that's a little bit more detailed in that it breaks down each of these sections into subsections, but in the end, you want to address these things. You write an executive summary at the beginning and that is written last. And again, you will put words together, you flesh out content, but your objective is to communicate how your business provides value to consumers, and how it provides value to you as the business owner. How do you generate a profit? And uh, here I go again to my second part of the gospel of the business plan, which is this, and after that I have no more gospel, but it is this, a business sustains itself and succeeds and grows to the extent that it provides value to consumers. And by value, we are not, let me go back to that, I'm sorry. By value, we mean things that the consumer wants or things that the consumer needs. We're not talking about moral values or um, political values or um, just, again, something the consumer wants or needs. So let's uh, dig in to what goes in a business plan. You, uh, I showed you that outline of like nine sections or so, but essentially there's four main areas that one addresses in a business plan. There's a business description. And again, you live with yourself, you live with your business, you live in your head, but no one else does. So you need to communicate who you are, what you do, who is the ownership. What industry does it work in? What are its mission, vision, and goals? Then you want to let the reader know how you connect with the market. Products and services, what are they? Who are your target customers? What uh, market context or industry context is, is in the background? What are your marketing communications? What are your sales strategy? Operations. How is the sausage made? What are the facilities? This section depends, I mean, it varies. Some businesses have very simple operations. If you're a factory that makes steel bars, uh, you have a more complex operation section. And again, your reader wants to know um, if you have it covered. Lastly, your financials. How do you make a profit? And uh, you will show revenue projections. You will definitely show a profit and loss statement. These last two, it depends. It depends who's asking. Okay, where do you begin? Here is where my style, what I suggest, is always to begin what, with thinking. Thinking precedes writing. There is no writing without thinking a little bit. So the first thing that I would prompt you to think about when writing a business plan is, you know, what is the opportunity that you see or that you feel you perceive that is prompting you to start a business? And if you were to create a picture, this is the picture that I come up with when I think of opportunity. There's a marketplace, there's endless consumers with endless needs and desires. You have some products and services that you can deliver. Your business is this, your business is this intersection here. But spend some time thinking how, what this intersection is about. If you define opportunity, you already have a bit of the narrative that goes in a business plan. Uh, you can describe the problem, the consumer problem, or the, you know, the desire that your company provides, solves, you 
can then define the products and services that are gonna solve that problem. And you can define your target market, who are the consumers or the people who have this problem. And here you are already answering questions for your reader. Let's do an example. So let's say you are, you have expertise in technology and you have worked for a big technology company and you have always been like, you know, solving clients problems on how to install this, how to solve that. And you have learned and seen uh, that there's many small companies that do not have uh, the knowledge and the skills to deal with the constant innovation and new products that come into the technology of managing and operating businesses. And you, you know, think that you could provide this expertise, you could hire yourself out, you could create a tech consulting business for small businesses. One example of the million of businesses that can exist. So since you started with the problem of the small business owners who do not know uh, how to deal with tech, uh, then this is your description. Well, you're gonna assist them. And then here you can think of a sentence that describes the problem that you're solving or the opportunity. What is it? Well, there's that new technology floods the marketplace constantly. Businesses have, have numerous options. They don't know how to choose. They don't have the knowledge. This is where your business comes in. So now you're giving your reader something specific, something that enables them to see the value that your business brings to the marketplace. With that description, maybe your products and services would become a list somehow like this. You can offer just general consulting. There can be some, you can also offer installation and downloading, network integration, training to use new technology. Products and services ideally become a list of items for which you bill your customers so that, you know, this can then service to make your sales projections. Um, so all that came from defining the opportunity. And you have your target market. So maybe your target market starting from the beginning right now is just the small businesses in Miami, Dade, and Broward counties, because maybe this is where you're based. This is where you already know some people. This is where you can begin knocking on doors. Uh, and you might maybe think of, okay, something more about these small businesses that could be my clients. Uh, maybe you define they will probably be making no less than $5 million because if not, maybe they cannot afford you. But they are also maybe not making more than $20 million because they they are making a whole lot of money. They have their own IT department. So this is, again, just an example in this particular business that we are imagining. You have written all that. Vision and mission. All business plans um, are expected to have this. Um, and this is one way you could write in that example. Become top of mind, third party technology information source for every small business in South Florida. Remember that business plan that I mentioned that is in your head? Well, you know, here's your opportunity to let the reader know what's in your head. Mission, uh, let's talk about the difference between vision and mission. Vision focuses on the future. Where do you see your business growing? How far, how wide? Mission is what, what do you see happening in the present? What is like what you set out to deliver to your customers every day to achieve for your customers every day? Mission can be more inspired. Mission is what some others might refer to as the why, why of the business? What is it that you wanna do? If we go back to the example, well, I mean, it's not only that you provide your expertise because you can, it's that in doing so, you improve that small business client that you have, you improve their productivity. 
by matching them with the best technology they can afford. So this is an example of how this business might state its mission. I'm gonna give you another example in a completely different, uh, so that we don't get just like obsessed about a technology consulting business because let's go to something completely different, barbecue restaurant. And this example is based on an actual restaurant out on uh, Southwest Miami-Dade on Calle Ocho somewhere. And this is what happened. Uh, there, was a, there was a barbecue place out there that uh, had been there for, for decades and it closed because the owner died and family didn't want to continue it. So the place closed down. So this entrepreneur that I happen to know, they saw this and they saw an opportunity Remember opportunity? Um, and the opportunity is that, you know, um, the people who had lost the place that they used to go to now needed a new place to go to and he could be that place. So he then decided to, he could improve on what had been done before by doing, adding these things. And these are all values that he's adding. We go back to the notion of adding value <clears throat> to your consumer. Also things that can be, you can charge for. And here's how this entrepreneur could maybe describe uh, this business in a written business plan. So let's say it's gonna be called Best Barbecue. It's a country style family restaurant serving pit fire barbecue meat with Cuban food side dishes. Then it goes into why, you know? Well, because the far Southwest Miami Dade area lacks genuine barbecue restaurants and has very few entertainment options, even more so after this place closed down. So that's why Best Barbecue exists, to offer a one of a kind family restaurant in a one acre facility. And, you know, again, this, there's many ways to say this same thing. This is just how it came out for me. Next, you go into, okay, I have this restaurant. Who will eat in my restaurant? And given that this is a brick and mortar place and you have to be there in person to eat the food, sure, they can do delivery. But even that uh, typical with brick and mortar businesses, uh, your target market, you know, more often, I mean, most of the time, if not all of the time, is the geographic trade area that is serviced by that facility. So that I usually think of it as the one mile, three mile and five mile radius around the location. So it will be the people who live nearby in that geographic radius that you define, the people who work nearby. Then there's also People going to and from the Everglades because they have to drive past that restaurant and the same with the Mikosuki Casino. If they come from the Mikosuki Casino, they have to drive by that restaurant. So this is targets too. Yay, we have a target market. Let's tell our reader more about the target market because the business plan has to inspire confidence in yourself and in your reader. So, I would tell my reader that in that trade area, there are 30, 37,415 households and that they spend an average of this much in dining out. And because I wanna be truthful, I wanna specify that this is dinner, this doesn't include lunch. Uh, I will also tell my reader that there's 17,625 employees working in the trade area and that the average daily traffic driving by the restaurant is 17,826 cars. So I'm telling my reader, I've got people here that I can pull into my restaurant, not all of them, but quite a few of them. Where did I get the numbers? Good question. So uh, US Census gives you all kinds of statistics um, when you, have time, go into it, check it out, you'll see. Traffic counts, the Florida Department of Transportation has a website and one of the tabs in the website is traffic counts. And if you, you, know, you can see, you click here, you click there, you put the address and you get your traffic counts. There are also databases that will give you, um, those, these two are free. 
these two are free databases. There are some that are paid, like Demographics Now or like site reports. These are not free, but if you're an SBDC customer, client, we can get you uh, reports from these databases for free. It's one of the services that we provide. Next, so now you've told your reader what you do, what you serve, who your target market is. You've even quantified it a little bit, which is great. Uh, you want to give them some context uh, of the industry, because for starters, you know, is is anyone still eating barbecue meat? Well, maybe they are, maybe they're not. Do not assume, but uh, not. Let me just say. You know, this is a you know an easy example for most people. Most people are familiar with restaurants. Most people are familiar with barbecue restaurants. But there are many uh, businesses and services and industries that your reader is not familiar with. And you you help yourself. You help your case by by uh, giving some context of what the industry is about. Uh, you want to educate yourself. Uh, educate your reader, you want to get some revenue parameters, and you want to dispel myth from fact. Uh, we don't know. I mean, yeah, people are still eating barbecue, but more? Is it growing? Is it not? So you are going to be searching in different ways uh, for the overall size of your industry and of segments within your industry. Uh, projected growth. Is it growing? Pause. Consider if you were writing a business plan for a store that rents videos the way Blockbuster did, <clears throat> you know, you would get, a, a, you know, your, the projected growth of this industry is not going to be, which is there's that kind of like segment industry does not exist anymore. So you want to see what what is about or maybe there is maybe there's a little niche thing that continues to rent videos and is growing. We need to find out. If you can, you want to find the size of your industry in your market, for example, maybe Miami-Dade County, and then you want to get a sense of trends and facts that are kind of like particularly relevant or timely in your industry. For example, trade associations, they have information. We go to that and we learned from the trade association that the U.S. restaurant industry as a whole did this much in 2018. Of course, you would want a more updated figure than that, but you would find it. Uh, this was an increase over the year before. So it's growing, it's big, it's growing. Okay, now we know that. How about barbecue restaurants? Let's keep looking. Well, it turns out there's something called Mental Menu Insights, and they told us that Barbecue restaurants in particular have increased 8% between these two dates. Uh, barbecue as a flavor has decreased. So you get some insight here. People, it's not that they like the barbecue flavor. It's like they want the real barbecue stuff. Hey, okay, now we know. Additional industry insight. Consumers are into health and wellness. Consumers are into sustainable and natural. Consumers are into small luxuries. Things to keep in mind. Because then you might think more ideas. Can I make my barbecue more health oriented? Sustainable, natural. Hmm. Maybe you can add a lean section in the menu, which many restaurants have done. Uh, even the pancake restaurants like Denny's and IHOP, they now have like lean and they show the calories and uh, this is important as for a restaurant operator to know and to keep in mind. And it, uh, it serves you to show it in the business plan in the sense that it lets your reader know that you know your industry. So it inspires confidence in that reader that you know how to do what you're about to do. Local market overview, again, if you can. And in this example, we could. Uh, in Miami-Dade County, there's 62 barbecue restaurants. Their average annual sales is 1.1 million. Hmm, okay. So that means that you can target, you know, this as your 
um, average annual sales. And, you know, it might be a little below, might be a little above, but it gives you an idea of where the ballpark is in performance, financial performance, sales performance for these restaurants. Of these 62, because they are all throughout the county, identify the ones that are closest to you. What are the strengths? What are their weaknesses? Because that's where you come in to differentiate yourself. Okay, so now you have your industry in a complete picture of where you are. You need to then start bringing in those customers. So that is sales and marketing. Uh, nothing in a business happens without sales. And sales does not happen without marketing. So worth spending some time thinking about it. So in a business plan document, when you talk about sales and the sales strategy, this is what I want you to describe because there's many ways to sell and your reader doesn't know. So if this is your company and this is your end customers, your products and services up here are designed to satisfy the needs and wants of these customers down here, how do they get to them? And there's many ways because it depends on your business. Now, here you decide between two main things or a combination. And the two main things are you're either selling business to customer, B2C, or you're selling business to business or a combination. If you're selling business to customer, then it's simple, you know, and direct, here's your consumer, here's you, boom. Now these two things, they, I'm sorry, this path, you can do in one of two ways that I can think of. There might be others, but the two that I think of is you can sell over the internet through your website, or you can have your own store where you place, or, or restaurant where you place your products. Now, many businesses sell through other businesses, and there's a whole uh, web of ways to do that. So spend some time thinking exactly how your products and services flow from, from your production to the customer, and then describe uh, in your business plan so that your reader understands how you do what you do. Maybe you have a food product that you manufacture, or maybe let's get out of food. Let's say you have a hair care product that you manufacture and you sell it through independent hair salons. So I guess you go, you can say you manufacture it here, then you put it in your storefront dealers, which are the hair salons, and they sell it to your end customers. Uh, one um, uh, benefit of sorting it out is also that depending how you sell, what your sales strategy is, that also informs your marketing strategy and, your, and, and, and who you market to. Because if you're selling through storefront dealers, you not only have to market to your end customers and let them know how your product sells, uh, or solves their problem, you have to market and convince store from dealers that uh, your product solves their problem as well. And that gets us into sales. Sales, uh, there's, okay, sales is its own sport. And it can be learned, it can be improved. There are sales techniques. Uh, some people are. Some people have a natural ability for it. Uh, some people love it, and uh, some people don't. And some people do it in different ways. But the 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 commonality in in all types of sales approach is that uh, sales solves the client's problem or need or want. So an effective sales, whether it's a person who has the natural gift of talking and selling you something or whether it's an organization that, that has 
like the pharmaceutical companies that they have a very well orchestrated uh, sales approach. They, they have all spent some time, uh, or they all know their customer's problem. Yeah, they all know it. I mean, some people just know it instinctively because they're good salespeople and some organizations spend time studying it and defining it. So you know your customer's problem. So then you make and you package and you price and you distribute in a way that solves the problem. You assess how your product or service is different than competitors. Uh, and then you impress number two and number three. This, this, this has to go in the client's mind. The client has to understand uh, the value. Little tip here, I have heard one of the most useful things that I have heard uh, about humanity in general, but it came from sales. It takes the average person listening to something seven times before they wrap their head fully around that information, especially if it's new information. And that is the reason why sales tends to be, um, you know, a, a lot of repetition, repeating the features and benefits of the products, why salespeople can be so annoying that way. But it responds to, to that. It, it may take, again, um, listening to the same thing to say, oh my God, wow, but this is free. I didn't get that from the beginning. Or, you know, probably you would get that from the beginning, but like, oh my God, this is only, all I have to do is this. Uh, I think I'll buy it. Uh, so that. Marketing, as I said, sales doesn't happen without marketing. So what is marketing? And what is the difference between marketing and sales and marketing and advertising? Okay, let me answer the questions real quick. What is marketing? I will tell you in the next slide. The difference between marketing and advertising is that advertising is one of the forms of marketing. What is the difference between marketing and sales? Well, my answer to this is this. Marketing is something that you put out to the consumer group as a whole. Sales is what comes in to finally close the deal with that one single consumer. What is the difference between a business plan and a marketing plan? A business plan is broader. It includes financials, it includes operations, it includes personnel. Marketing plan just focuses on your target customer, your communications uh, with them and your products and services. So this is what is marketing or what is a marketing strategy? This is, this is how I would uh, present it in a business plan. Company activities that are geared to stimulate, elicit, or produce demand for the company's products or services. And notice that I am saying demand, not sales, because again, marketing and sales are first cousins, but they are not identical twins and they are not Siamese twins. So marketing produces a demand. Marketing creates in the consumer the desire or the need to have your product. You still haven't closed the sale. Uh, good marketing, you generate visibility. They have to see you. And this is the first thing in, in how I understand it. They have to see you. What you show the consumer has to resonate with, with some problem they might have so that your target market says, hey, they're talking to me. You have to enable connection. It's like, oh, there's something that uh, I've been looking for. How do I connect with them? So you have to enable connection. And that's what translates in those like click here, learn more, call now, those call to actions. And then if all this is effective, if you have combined all these things in the right way, if you have told your company story, if your brand has some distinction, your product has some distinction if you have um, a combination of features that really solve your client's problem, you will get demand. People will want your brand's products and services. So back to that written document, just think about, are you gonna be in social media? Are you gonna be in traditional media? Are you gonna sponsor events? Are you gonna create partnerships? These are business to consumer uh, ways to 
do that visibility, that resonance, that connection. You can connect through these ways. So this is what you would describe in your business plan. If you're a business to business kind of business, then you want to be in industry networking events, trade group conference. You might want to take an ad in a trade publication. You might want to affiliate with, with other uh, organizations or companies that with whom you do not compete, but you know, maybe you are synergistic. Operations. Okay, so you figure out sales and marketing, it's done. Operations, again, this is for the benefit of your reader. Okay, wait, you're great. You have a great product or services. You know how to market it, you know, but I don't even know where you're located. I don't even know how you do this. I don't even know if you're real. Um, and this is where you give the address and description of your facility. <laughs> where is it? How big is it? What is it? Um, I had a business one time whose business was to give aquatic therapy. She had, uh, she was lovely. She is lovely. She had all the training. Uh, she knew the industry inside and out. She knew how to provide value. Uh, she was missing one thing. She didn't have a swimming pool. Uh, so we have to see, well, how are you going to provide aquatic therapy if you don't have a swimming pool? Hers might have been the only community in Miami-Dade County that didn't have a swimming pool, but there it was. Uh, describe the licenses and permits so that your reader you know, knows that you are aware of things like licenses and permits. What equipment do you have? What software? What suppliers? Um, for all you know, you know, you're, anyway, this is important. You might do a flow chart if, if your operations are complicated. And I have seen one business where the, where the, where the process was somewhat complicated but a flow chart kind of like just helped in lighting it. And then staffing, uh, you know, you cannot be making 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 of anything a day just by yourself, probably not. So if you're telling me that you're making and selling 5,000 of anything a day, please tell me what is your staffing? What are the job descriptions? I will believe you better if you tell me. Speaking of operations, what's the management team? And uh, here, what I want you to keep in mind is that it takes both big picture person, that person who's all inspired and has great vision and most founders are here. And that's great, it, this is necessary. This can maybe get it launched, inspiration comes here. But you need the nuts and bolts person. Uh, because that is what gives long-term sustainability is somebody who can, uh, you know, be a big, be a bean counter or just see how the nuts and bolts uh, work together. Many businesses, many small businesses, many of our clients are solopreneurs. Well, guess what? Then you have to do both. Uh, and that, that is hard. And that's why I admire uh, people who, who do it. Uh, but you need both. The ideal management team, if only, it would be four people. So if you have two, if there's two, a team of two, that's an advantage, you're already ahead. Uh, if not, then if you're a solopreneur, then you're doing all fours, all four of these aspects. Lastly, financial statements, and this is the last topic. And what I um, would, would always suggest that you do uh, is become familiar with any of the software for, for, uh, yeah, for, for, for calculations, for whether it's Microsoft Excel, whether it's Numbers, which is the Apple product, just start learning it. This is the most empowering tool you will find to own the numbers of your business and owning your numbers and owning your own calculations. Even if you hire an accountant on the side to do your monthly reports and your bookkeeping, you should be the person that best knows your numbers because you are the owner, you are the founder, the buck stops with you. Plus, you don't want anyone telling you things 
about your business that you don't want unpleasant surprises. Let me put it that way. Uh, so this is technology that I encourage you to have and you write this in your business plan that you have this and this and this and any other technology software that you use. And many clients ask, how do I make revenue projections? Uh, and yes, business plans tend to have revenue projections. They are, projections are an educated guess and both words are important. It's a guess because if in the future they might pan out, they should pan out closely. They are an educated guess. Uh, and it begins by sorting out of your particular business. And we have seen that there's all kinds of businesses. So each business has a different unit of revenue. But for example, if it's a restaurant, your revenue unit is your meal ticket, you know, that thing that the customer brings to the cash register and pays, that's what's the average. And with that, you can calculate. So let's say your, uh, let's say your meal ticket average is $12. And let's say that lunch typically brings 100 people. So your average revenue for lunch is 12 times 100, 1200. Uh, that's on a typical lunch day. Uh, there is a template for restaurants revenue calculation that create, has a, it's like a table that has the seven days of the week and the three meal periods. So you can create um, you know, a little small data set where you say, well, on Friday's dinner, uh, my average is $20 and I tend to have 200 people for dinner. And then you cal calculate it that way for Friday dinner. You can do the same for Thursday. You can do the same for Wednesday, the other times of day. And then you have like an average for the week. And then you multiply by 52 weeks in the year. And then you have the average for the year. So there's your educated guess. Uh, technology consulting, you maybe this is your unit, your revenue unit. Uh, last, I'm going to give you an example of a daycare, how we did this in a plan that we worked on recently. So we started with a baseline. This is a, an owner, this is somebody who was buying an existing daycare. The daycare was, is, had been in operations for years. And this is what the daycare had by way of revenue. It had this different, uh, age groups. It had four babies, nine toddlers, 12 two-year-olds, like that. And this is the rate that the daycare charged for um, the age group. So baseline revenues were this. This is, we used Excel and Excel, as I said, you learn to use it and it does this multiplication very easily and spits it out and puts it in a nice table. Now, he was asking for a loan to buy this daycare, so he had to project what his revenues were going to be going forward, and he had a plan, and his plan was that he was going to increase the rates after three months of owning the business. He was going to increase the rate. He was going to justify that, that increase because he was making improvements in the facility, renovating, adding a playground, making it better so he could justify uh, the increase in rates. So he was going to be at baseline the first three months. Then for the next three months, he was going to be at a uh, higher revenue due to the higher rate. And then he also planned and made the case that he was going to even and enroll more children uh, because he was going to market more differently, better. So this is an example of making revenue projections. In this case, we started with the baseline, the historic baseline, and then went to adjust it to an increase that could be justified with the different things that are uh, the way that you make your sales projections. They have to rest on some assumptions of what's going to happen to um, support that sales projections. This is how he spelled it out. 
company takes over business with existing enrolling at current rates. That's the baseline. New weekly rates will go in effect in month four after buying the business. Current clients are advised of upcoming increase. Company works to get new customers to make up for any customers that leave because they don't like the higher rates. Company is going to make over 20,000 worth of facility improvements beginning in March in month one to justify increased rates in month four. Company's marketing focus is to increase enrollment of babies and three year olds. So he was going to focus on these two age groups. So here we go again. These are specifics. Uh, and he's not taking over the world. He's just going to do different things that. I can be persuaded as a reader that might work to get him the sales he's projecting. Lastly, you do have to present a profit and loss statement. So essentially we took his revenue projections from here and they go here. This is the total revenue, a profit and loss statement as you might have seen they has a standard format where the revenues go on the top. That's why it's called top line revenue. You have your gross profit and then expenses, you list them one by one. All templates give you like a starting list of typical expenses that businesses have every month. And then you can add as you need and then you end up with your profit. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and I am going to stop here and see what is uh, in the Q and A. So, okay, unfortunately I cannot I, unfortunately, I cannot see you, so I cannot see uh, Paul Barb business change according with business revenue. I'm not sure what the question is in there, but but I will say that a business plan tends a business plan document will always be evolving. And yes, indeed, uh, you know the business plan can change and evolve as you execute, as you see what actually you know what the problem is that you're actually solving you you set out to solve this problem and then you started executing and then you learned that actually the problem you end up really solving is this uh and your customers are really coming from this problem so you can change it that way in different ways i'm not sure if that answers the question to paul Barr, but thank you for the question we have a question that says where do you go to find information on your industry and uh, and market, how would you phrase the question in a Google search? Uh, good question. So um, the way that you would, the, the way Google, Google is very uh, open and fluid. So let's say, let's go back to the technology consulting. Uh, I would start by, I would, it, it's a trial and error, you know, Technology consulting firms, what? Technology consulting firms in Miami-Dade County. Maybe I would start there uh, and see what list it gives me. Then I see, then maybe, then, then maybe I would Google independent technology consulting firms uh, and see what it gives me. Uh, Google usually spits out um, a list of, of answers. So it, it, it depends on what you get back. Um, for actual numbers like this, like population demographics, statistics, um, you can ask questions like, how big is the, oh, what's some industry that I've had recently? How big, how big, oh yeah. Okay, how big is the market for oil spill disaster mitigation? 
working with a client who has a product in oil spill disaster mitigation. So we were trying to find industry statistics. So that's how we put it on Google. How big is the market for oil spill disaster mitigation? And that's where we began. And Google spits out a series of answers and clicking here, clicking there, we got to um, places that were measuring this industry. And each uh, the answers that you get, some are more on point to what you're looking for, some are less on point, but that is the process. It's a, it's a trial and error in a way. We have some databases. Uh, you can also ask us or check with us. We have databases that have some industry very well defined according to Nike's codes. Nike's and AICS, you might have come across that term. That means North American Industry Classification System. And many databases grouped industries uh, according, or businesses according to their Nike's code and produced statistics that way. Um, moving on to the next question. Thank you for that question. I hope that was uh, something of an answer. Um, what advice would you give for someone who can write everything down for their business plan, but is not motivated to execute and take action to actually start the business? Uh, I'm with you. I am with, whoever asked this question, I am with you. I am with you. And you are prompting me to make my full disclosure. I have never been a business owner. I am not interested in being one. I am not interested in uh, running a business because what I like to do is read, write, and think. That's what I like to do. Maybe talk a little bit. Uh, but, but it has never been in me a passion to own and operate my business. And what I have learned and uh, from working with different clients is that it, it is a lot of work. It takes um, energy and, and stamina and resilience and if if you know I, while i can do while i can sit and write a document for hours on end and not you know uh be um turned off by it um i don't know that i want to do the same with you know selling creating something to 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 sell so my answer would be, my advice would be, then don't go into business. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to. So if you're not motivated to execute and take action to actually start the business, um, or, or, or here's another thing. If you think that you do have it, but it just, it just needs some warming up, keep your day job, keep your day job and start it like, like on, as a side gig on a small scale, just in an area where you feel comfortable, where you feel you can start throwing off something to the market that, uh, you know, that doesn't require you to go all out. You can keep your whatever other income you have steady uh, and pay your bills. What I do advise always uh, is do not put yourself between a rock and a hard place. Do not quit your job and say, I'm going to start a business that hasn't I'm started yet. And this is not going to pay my bills because it success does take a little bit of time. There are exceptions. Maybe you come from a family that is in a business and you're walking into the family business and you're very familiar with it. Okay, fine. But if you have not had experience um, operating a business, then uh, start small. Uh, start feeling it out. Hatch. Get a hedge in terms of how you're going to pay your bills. Um, because we all love businesses. The marketplace needs businesses. Businesses solve most people's problems. But, but, and you can become as rich as your talent and luck. I mean, there's talent, hard work, knowledge, experience, and there's an element of luck as well. So the market will reward you to know, and, and it should, because it's hard work. But if it doesn't, no one is gonna to come to your rescue. So do not put yourself between a rock and a hard place. And then the next question is, what is the best way to determine what your product should cost to create revenue statements? Um, it should be, oh, okay. So what your product should cost to you, I guess this is what this question means. Uh, 
how much your product cost to you so that when you sell it at a price, you have a margin of, of profit in that product. Yeah. Uh, do you need to make the calculations? It's hard to know in a vacuum off the top of your head and in different industries, in different um, product categories, those margins are, are different. I once, when I was a newspaper reporter, I once had the opportunity to talk to the CEO of a large chain of sporting goods stores that is no longer in business. And one of the things he told me, which I thought was really insightful, is the way that chain went about its uh, sourcing, its products, they would first determine how much they needed to sell it at in order for it to be competitive. So let's say basketballs, let's say they determine the basketballs have to be priced between 20 and $50. I'm making up those numbers because I don't remember. Between 20 and $50. Then once they determine that, they would back engineer from that and say, well, our profit margin needs to be X percent. I mean, our gain needs to be X percent. So let's say if they sell it at 50, they wanted their gross margin on that to be 40. Uh, then, well, that's, once they determine that, they would go to the manufacturers and look and look and look and push and push and push until they could get a manufacturer who could make it for them at a cost at which they could sell. Uh, now this, at the time, again, this was a large chain of stores. They had leverage because they could go to manufacturers and put huge uh, size, huge volume of orders. So they had leverage in negotiating the cost. But that's how you would go about it. It's like, okay, what should my price be to be competitive? And then at what cost do I need to get it to, uh, to be able to sell it at that price and have a profit margin. Next question said, thank you for the question. That is, these are great questions. These are great questions. And these are the things that you spend some time thinking about when you uh, flesh out your business plan. Okay, uh, next question says, I'm having trouble finding all the legal requirements in my industry. How can I be sure I am not violating laws I don't know about when I don't have excessive capital for lawyer consultation? Um, that is a great question and it makes me smile because I'm thinking, because it makes me curious, what industry are you in? Um, but I do a Google search. You know, what are the requirements to sell meat wholesale? And a lot of things come up. You need a permit from the FD, from the USDA, and you also need a permit from the Florida Department of Agriculture. Uh, what you know? Again, it depends on the industry, but I would just do a straight up Google search uh, that usually are very good. Actually, among the Google searches, typically you get a, a lot of like uh, snippets from law firms that specialize in helping businesses get permits in those industries. And, you know, those are, they are, that's their marketing to get their target customers. But in between that list that Google will fill out, sometimes you will find one that comes either from a government agency or from a white paper that somebody wrote or from a trade association. So that's one way to research it. Another way is to ask somebody who's already in the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, um, plumbing, I recently worked with a plumbing business. <clears throat> Plumbers have to be licensed by this and by that and, and like that. Um, so that, that's where I would start. If your industry is more convoluted than that and has more legal nuances, uh, <clears throat> then I don't know, I, I, without knowing what industry it is, but again, I'm really curious what industry it is, but yeah, just Google it. Uh, 
Next question, would communication with manufacturers be a part of determining the costs? If, uh, if, if your business involves a product that you buy from manufacturers, yes, yes, they, they, they are. You need to know because different uh, manufa because manufacturers uh, will, will educate you on the industry and on how they work. And some manufacturers, for example, uh, will only accept a minimum order of product. So you need to know that because you need to know if you wanna start with, with whatever volume they require. Um, and, and, and whether you can afford it. Or then if you need to look for manufacturers that specialize in small order. And also manufacturers may have different pricing depending on the volume of items that you order. And also with manufacturing, there is the, the, the issue of if this is a new product that you design, the manufacturer might not have the, what is called the tooling for it. So they might wanna charge you for the tooling. Uh, so you need to learn that. Are you, are you getting from the manufacturer a product that they are already making and you're just buying from them and reselling it? Or have you designed a product that you want to have a manufacturer produce and so they need to create a new mold for it for whatever it is and that will cost you some money as well. Uh, and I, I hear that that's the last question. All righty, thank you so much, Alina. Um, so I would just like to say thank you for everyone for participating today. Um, please just be on the lookout for a thank you email from our team. It should come from our FBDC events email. Uh, we'll include a link to the recording for this event, as well as a copy of the presentation. Um, if you'd like to receive any sort of further assistance from Melina or our consulting team, I would suggest registering with our center, um, which you can do on our website, sbdc.fiu.edu. And there also will be some information in regards to that in the thank you email as well. Um, so thank you again, Alina, um, and we're going to close pleasure. for the day. Thank you all for uh, thank you all for for joining and and participating and listening. And congratulations on whatever uh, business adventure you have you know undertaken all to this point. It's it's an adventure, and I admire it. All right, everyone, have a great afternoon. Thank you.